Yeah, uh, I'll get started, and uh, I promise I'll keep this talk short because I only have seven, eight slides. Uh, so this is more like a lightning talk. Uh, what I'm going to talk about is very much networking focused. Basically, it's uh, more like more, more or less a case study, how we're using the eBPF to do the you know to trace the so-called distributed system RPC layers. But we do have to look into the kernel, look into the sort of the you know the TCP stacks. Uh, so yeah, so I'll, I'll get started. Oh, this is my first slide. Uh, yeah, I introduce myself. My name is Wembo. I've been at Google this month uh, for almost uh, 15 years. Uh, I started mostly working on the Google's front-end networking infrastructure. That's the sort of the software layer stack that handles internal facing, internet facing traffic, you know, search, Gmail, so things. Uh, these days, uh, the team I work at, at uh, is the cloud networking team. Uh, we specifically, uh, we, we created this thing called gRPC, which is a RPC protocol, uh, supposed to be working everywhere, not quite, but it's being very popular. Uh, but increasingly, yeah, our focus has been more on the, on the sort of the cloud side of the traffic when the communication becomes you know, more or less the server to server or application to application. Uh, I'll go over the sort of the challenges, the difference we're facing compared to the traditional sort of internet facing traffic when the client's running outside of your own infrastructure, but then you have the infrastructure uh, to handle those traffic. So the use case uh, is pretty straightforward. And uh, in the cloud case, uh, this is the, what do we call the, the cloud API. So this is the software as a service stack. Uh, on the left side, you can see that this is all where the client, you know, the, the client side of the stacks, uh, the different networking layers, uh, you know, the so-called layer three, layers up all the way to the layer seven. Uh, except these days, you know, protocols like HTTP2, Quick, they kind of be used as a transport on top of the TCP. And then the layer three is also virtualized, which means that there's a lot of software components involved, which I didn't include here. But it's not as straightforward as sort of the traditional data center networking when the client talks to a server directly over the TCP. Uh, there's no proxy, but in this case, yeah, not only uh, on the client side, it's complicated, but between the client and the actual service, uh, there are sub multiple software components, either in the layer seven or layer four, uh, serve as proxies. Uh, one of the sort of uh, knowledge I used to, you know, the, the kind of problem we are running into on, on the networking space is I like to think about, uh, you can imagine that, you know, if once you, if you use MySQL, Postgres, or Oracle, you know, I was talking to Nick from, our, from Oracle, uh, you kind of this, you know, you have the client, uh, the whole database protocols kind of assume the underlying TCP connection never goes down. Uh, if it goes down, chances are the peer is gone. Basically, the database, the, that, that particular server node is gone, right? So that's sort of the model. But these days in the cloud, the kind of service uh, we will be looking at is effectively database applications. In the Google Cloud case, we're, we're running big table, cloud big table, cloud spanner. Uh, span is kind of like a relational database. So the application we're looking into is like those mission critical transactional application run by uh, companies that do you know online, their own whole online businesses depending on that. So they are using the so-called RPC protocol effectively like how you would access the MySQL uh, locally in a trad traditional client server environment, except the whole networking, the data paths are very complicated. Uh, so yeah, I'm, so the problems we're running into is like how do we debug uh, the issues? And then we noted, we found that eBPF can really play a role uh, specifically on the client side. So I will be mostly focusing on sort of the instrumentation part, not so much about the analytic part once the data is collected. Because on the cloud side, there's this massive infrastructure to do analytics. Uh, the a little bit background. So overall, this thing follows to the so-called distributed RPC tracing. I'll, I'll just go through the background very quickly. Uh, Aris here, he along Google's uh, Dapper team. So if you do have questions about Dapper, uh, which is also published, you should talk to him, not me. But overall, yeah, the, the RPC tracing and the concept is simple. You you have the you know the concept of uh, trace, then you have this uh, a tree of spans. Each span 
you know, it's essentially kind of denote a, a request response, right? So it's synchronous in nature. Uh, and then on the span, you can also have the, the so-called annotation, which is basically all the events happens on the span. Uh, so, in t so the way Diaper is used in Google, uh, we integrate the Diaper with our internal RPC system, which is Stubby. Uh, and then it's also integrated in, uh, in the HTTP layer, which I have been working on, uh, which runs you know, the, the contextual learning, for example, on web or mobiles. Uh, and then we also have our different frameworks. So the idea is that if this tracing will give you an end-to-end -end view of you know, the latency and the breakdown and different you know, RPC spans, uh, like tried RPCs. On the server side, you can imagine a search queries can span thousands of you know, spans, something like that. Uh, one of the things uh, one of my colleagues uh, did is to, uh, they added a kernel level uh, tracing. Uh, I think this is also talked about publicly. Uh, so the idea is that they you know, you are able to, on the, on the send side, you're able to trace between the user space and the kernel and, and on the, at the I.O. layer, you know, in terms of the when the RPC payload actually gets sent, delivered on the, over the network. Uh, and then this is on the cloud side, uh, you know, we have gRPC, uh, which, which is equivalent to Stubby. Typically, people use it for microservices uh, within a data center, within the cloud. And uh, then there's open census, which is sort of uh, being duplicated by open telemetry, uh, which is uh, which is being uh, it's an CNCF project. So These are so-called cloud native, uh, you know, foundations. They have a lot of collection of projects, including Kubernetes, gRPC, all those things. Uh, the, the the overall, you know, this is more like a networking specific topic. So what, the way I look at it is. There are two things. One is uh, for the networking to be useful these days, especially the distributed uh, systems, uh, the tracing, the monitoring, the observability, and the RPC layer really ha have to work together. Uh, th this is so. As a, someone working on the networking, we really been, uh, you know, working very closely, try to understand you know, how to integrate it with the tracing systems. We're not building any tracing specific technologies, but also on the tracing side, the way I look at it is. You know, you really have to, you know, if you talk about distributed tracings, and then the tracing has to really integrate into the network as well to be useful. Uh, the distributed system, it's not like old days. It's, it's, you know, the latency between the client and server is not really decided by uh, the, you know, the, the long trip on the networking side, like how fast you can deliver the packet anymore. It is, you know, especially things like tail latency, it's highly tied to you know, the kernel scheduling, especially today, these days with all the multi-threaded, multi-core uh, software so running on the client side or in the applications. Uh, so overall, to me, the whole tracing, the networking and the tracing uh, really need to be highly integrated to be useful uh, for both sides. Uh, that also go back to, you know, all these unconference topics, which I find is super useful, except I can only attend one at a time is that try to standardize the tracing because otherwise a uh, lot of things get reinvented over and over, you know, especially things like format, how do we encoding the tracing, those things. So now I'm going to talk about the actual uh, subject for the, for, the, for, the, uh, for the talk. It's the eBPF side of things. So like I said, we're, we use eBPF mostly just for the client side monitoring, uh, for the instrumentation. Uh, Specifically, we are trying to monitor the, the full networking, all the layers, including, you know, starting from the TCP, which is in the kernel. But then the TLS, uh, we have to break it down so you can do the TLS uh, handshake in the kernel. But for the, you know, you can do, you can do decryption from the eBPF. So we use the U probe, user space probing uh, for the, to pass the unencrypted uh, TLS payload. The actual payload in the gRPC case is HTTP2 frames. Uh, so we pass the HTTP2 frames in the eBPF as well. Uh, with some, you know, I'm going to talk about the, the problems we're running into. Uh, so, so overall, with the eBPF, it gives us a visibility otherwise we don't have 
across the whole layer four all the way to the layer seven, including the HTTP. <coughs> now, you may ask, you know, why this is all the space stuff? Uh, why don't you just, uh, you know, modify the, you know, use, you know, add the trace points, do the instrumentation in the your layer? So here's the motivation here. Uh, the biggest, you know, the, the first thing is that the kind of software layers where in the cloud uh, we're using, uh, unlike in, internal in Google, you know, you can modify the source code, you know, you can modify the software stack to add the tracing support. Here, uh, some of the stack actually provided as part of the long, uh, language runtime. For example, in Rust, the, all the TLS, HTTP2 are done as part of the language runtime, so you can't really modify anything there. Uh, and also a lot of the, uh, and there's a third party software involved. And the, the reason is that, you know, there's more than 10 languages. So it is really very difficult to, uh, to, to add the, you know, the very consistent or accurate uh, instrumentation across all those languages. Uh, the other thing is that, uh, that's sort of the main uh, problems where we're looking at is, when for protocols like RPC protocols like gRPC, we use HTTP2 as a transport. When the RPC request response has got multiplexed on, on top of the TCP. So this is really complicated things. For example, uh, when the, you know, a particular, let's say, packet loss uh, happens in the networking, and the, the, you know, at the RPC layer, you're saying very different things. It's very hard to di distinguish between you know, layer three packet loss and all and issues caused by flow control or congestion control or specifically you know, at the application layer uh, or the uh, service layer. So being able to have a visibility across all the layers really gave us, uh, you know, the, ca the capability to debugging things and also to optimize the latencies. Uh, the other thing is so we noted that is, you know, even think, you know, HTTP2 has been there for a while the implementation, because the protocol uses TCP uh, as the transport, but otherwise it's a mo you know, multiplex RPCs on top of the TCP. HTTP is also RPC protocol. Uh, this causes a lot of issues, for, specifically in, in the flow control. It has uh, request called stream level flow control, and then it has connection level uh, flow control, which is defined on top of the, as part of the HTTP2, pro HTTP2 protocol. And then you still have a socket level flow control, which is done by the kernel, you know, handle the buffer. And now, then you have a congestion control at the actual, you know, the, the TCP layer. So, so not all the implementation are done things equally, you know. The spec is, could also be somewhat vague, right? So this kind of problems uh, really need us to sort of look into the actual wire bytes to debug issues. And the problem can be even become more complicated with Quick. Uh, HTTP3, which with Quick, basically you're moving the TCP uh, into the user space. So, so we, we think, uh, yeah, eBPF, those technologies, being able to pass uh, those layers, the protocol layers uh, in the eBPF really uh, give us the, the visibilities. Uh, the next slide, I'll just go through the, the bunch of challenges on the technical side when we're using the eBPF uh, to act, you know, to develop a solution that can actually be deployed. Uh, at this point, we're actually deploying this with one of the users, which use Google Cloud, you know, span the, the, the database. Uh, they have been running into a lot of problems because it's a multi-cloud deployment. This, so they run their clients uh, on-premise, and uh, then between the on-premise client and the Google's database, there are, really, there are a lot of components involved, so the transport is not very reliable. Uh, so we're actively deploying that. But I don't have uh, like open source project or the tools that I can just show you uh, the details of the implementation, but I'll go through the, uh, the specific challenges we're facing. Now the first one is the TRS. So uh, because we're using a user space probe, so you have to identify the exact function, the symbols, offsets, all that, and that turns out to be uh, difficult given you know all the different languages, different runtimes, and different uh, TLS libraries like uh, OpenSSL, Boring SSL, or some uh, in some languages uh, the TLS is implemented natively, uh, like Java. Uh, the second one is the HP2 parsing. So 
the problem with eBPF is that it doesn't allow us to pass uh, does any stateful parsing. Uh, in the HTTP2, HTTP2 case, the headers may be compressed with HPAC. So that's a, one of the challenging. You know, in theory, we can still pass it, but it would be very expensive. Uh, so, which means that the, the monitoring, the eBPF filter won't be able to really look into the values uh, of the headers. Uh, the third one is the how to, because the TCP, so the way the RPC layer works is you attach, you, you know, you dispatch the RPC request on a, on a connection or pool of channels for low, ba low balancing reasons. So it's very important to understand or track which request gets sent to which TCP connections. Uh, so the co co correlation between the TCP layer and the, the HTTP2 layer or the request layer uh, is also very, very important. Uh, so we're using you know, different technologies like the signature of the payload, uh, you know, file descriptor to, to make sure that events generated from the user space probing and the kernel probing can be correlated using the same ID uh, once the events are generated. Uh, so, so overall, you know, the, the biggest challenge is the last one I actually highlighted here, just to, to create a solution that's actually you know, you know, in the build time, in the deployment time, it's, 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 it can be managed. The, you know, if you look at all the languages, there are really three categories. There's a Go, and then there's basically languages for the TLS, HP2 stacks, they're using a C library. So those are much easier to deal with. And then you have a language like Java, uh, which, you know, they may, you know, the TLS is implemented in Java, which is uh, very difficult uh, to use eBPF. And then most of the deployment happens in you know, Kubernetes, those things, right? So there's a container. So the application is actually running on container, uh, but then the eBPF is in, installed against the host kernel. So you know, that's, that for the user, you probe to work, that, that costs also some challenges. Uh, then the next topic uh, we're looking to that, that uh, something that we specifically uh, Try, you know, this is something I guess uh, I wouldn't call it innovation because uh, there, are, there, are, there are researchers, you know, they have been doing the same thing. Is that uh, instead of writing all the events to share the memory, have an out of band process, external process to post process the data and then upload the data to uh, a pipeline for further processing. Uh, in our case, we found that there's a benefit to actually send the data, send the events back to the server. Uh, there is a similar researcher, for example, use a similar kind of model uh, for congestion control reasons. You know, the eBPF sending back the receiver side of the data or conditions to the to the sender. So uh, now this problem. Uh, so we look at a different solution. Initially, we thought that we would just have the eBPF directly mutated the TCP payload, uh, then we find it's, uh, that's impossible because you cannot allocate uh, the buffer on a TCP, uh, established TCP connections. So instead, uh, so this is not an entirely a transparent solution anymore. So instead, we will have the client libraries, uh, basically the application on the client side, I mean the, the user space application layer, not the actual application, uh, to periodically generate a post request so this basically provides a pre-allocated buffer for the eBPF to dump the events to, and which will be in turn will be sent uh, back to the server. So this solution will allow us basically yeah, to uh, avoid any kind of processing instead of doing all the processing on the server side. Now, in specifically in our case, that, that's beneficial because the server side, there's a lot of more machinery, and also you can create events across multiple processes. Uh, so there's more context in you know, all that. Uh, now the implications of doing this kind of data reporting is that uh, there is no post processing because we don't, you know, typically people use Python Go uh, to post process events. But here, uh, you know, most of the events will be just the raw events or simple metrics. And also the events have to be buffered because the, the post request, uh, which have the pre-allocated buffer, you know, we basically have to you know, keep an interval, you can't just keep sending the data to minimize overhead. So, so in between the chunks, uh, the events have to be buffered. Uh, so this is something we're looking into that, and uh, we 
you know, that's the different use cases uh, we are running into. So, th so this is the last slide. Uh, you know, I, I was thinking about it, those are questions, but in fact, uh, a lot of this uh, already been covered yesterday. Uh, but I'll go through this quickly, just in case you want to, you know, chat with me or, you know, I'll join the unconference uh, as well today. Uh, the first th thing is that, yeah, I think we have one of the topics yesterday talk about uh, standardizing the formats. I, I think this is uh, uh, going to be super useful. Uh, we like to sort of work with, uh, you know, this community uh, to find out if it's possible to uh, standardize both the encoding, the syntactical formats of the events, but also have a standard definition of those networking events because it, it, you know, those things has nothing to do with uh, Google Cloud or anything. They are, they are the general thing you know, for the networking. I think it's, you, there's no point to have all the different definitions. I, I think that's being very useful. And also this allows uh, different consumer of the events to be, you know, to, to benefit from a common, you know, a shared ecosystems. Uh, the other thing is I was talking to some HTTP community, uh, you know, especially the Quick, uh, they're also looking at the same thing. Uh, there's a Q locks, uh, which using the CBOR, CBOR as an encoding format and CDDL as the definition language. Uh, so overall to me, you know, all these things, you know, you know, we all like define new word formats. Now in Google, everything has to be started, you know, uh, you, know you cannot have, have to have a lot of reason not to use protobuf, but eventually you still be forced to go back to protobuf. Uh, but in our case for the, for the data reporting, because of the limitation of the EBP for EBPF, now, because of the constraint of the overall uh, solution, we will not be using uh, protobuf, right? But then we were, I was thinking that, you know, if some kind of compact format, uh, very efficient, but otherwise extensible format, we can use, it would be great. Uh, the second thing is the, so, as I described, there's a whole virtual networking, the, the packet layer networking. Now the problem here is that, that that layer is the one actually causing a lot of problems these days, and why we're de even debugging this, uh, developing this solution. Now the problem is, uh, after the TCP layer, after the TOS, and then it's become the packet, and uh, the payload of the RPC can be sent over multiple packets, and a single packet may also have multiple RPC payload, and they also, you know, the RPC, the payload of RPC also can even go over different L3 paths. Like how do we even uh, have this cross layer tracing between the layer four, layer seven, and the layer three? Uh, that's something we don't have a solution for. Now in the layer three, in the packet layer, we, we do have traces. I mean, there's a layer three traces. But how do you correlate RPC uh, with L3? Remember the L3 is not even running in the gas kernel. It's uh, completely a separate uh, networking stacks. Uh, one of the topics yesterday is the, the critical path analysis. So, so that can, may work, right? Instead of doing the trace, uh, like, you know, one-to-one -one kind of trace, you probably just try to create them in a very different way. Uh, so what kind of models that we could benefit is something I, you know, I'm very interested in. Uh, discussing with you guys. The other thing is the RPC tracing. Even the RPC tracing today, uh, it's not, you know, the spans, you know, the synchronous spans. Uh, it's not quite working if we want to debugging, you know, one way message latency, like someone I've talked to uh, already mentioned, like server streaming or just streaming in general. Like what is the, the data model? What, how do you visualize those things? Uh, I think that's also very important. And also there are other problems we're facing. You know, the RPC, there's, if you look at the tail latency, there's all this cold start issue, right? Because the, the connection may not be established, uh, the CPU may be in sleep mode, you know, all those things. So how do you create the background, the connection level, uh, the handshake with the RPC? Uh, those, those things are really useful to, to, to have a data model for and also have, uh, have the tracing support. Uh, the last thing, very briefly, uh, when we look at the eBPF, uh, we also build a, a benchmarking and also uh, try to build an uh, emulation-based uh, modeling. So the eBPF give us the data, but we like to, similar to one of, uh, the talk about the field testing, we, with eBPF, we're able to gather the real, real data from the production traffic in the cloud. But then the question comes, like how do you, quantify 
uh, the data pass performance, either for the purpose of the regression detection or optimization, uh, versus the one, you know, vers versus the the simulation based model, like what is the upper bound uh, in phase, for example, a layer three events, how the RPC layer responded, like you know, in terms of the gap. So you try to understand or quantify the gap between what's being observed and what is optimal uh, solution should be. Uh, it's, we find it's very useful. So, so that's something we have been looking into. And uh, I wonder if you know, any of you are interested in talking about those things, ideas. So, so this concludes my talk. Uh, any questions? So folks who heard the um, unconference yesterday are not going to be surprised I'll ask this. Um, so how successful are people using the cloud-based tracing to include their clients in the kind of uh, tracing? Do they get all of this nice data, uh, including all the, the L3 data that you're gathering, or is it limited to higher levels? Like what visibility do they have into the statistics that Google gathers as opposed to their own uh, open telemetry? Uh, yeah, the question is, uh, you know, on the for the cloud deployment, yeah, what, what are people actually getting? So I can talk about the, the current status. Uh, so on the cloud side, the open source side, yeah, there's open telemetry, open census. Uh, but if you, if I go back to the, so the, the problem is that uh, the tracing works, uh, the, you know, very similar to the DAPR, the RPC spans, but it, won't, it ends at the, it doesn't give you visibility on the sort of the the serving infrastructure side. So it's only on the kind up to uh, the, the VM and then the whole, everything else is a single span. So the visibility is, uh, visibility is pretty limited. Uh, the other problem is that, you know, this, all this, this is uh, the cloud infrastructure, so you have to pay for it. It's not, it's not free. Uh, the stuff we were working on, uh, we, that's part of the reason we try to collect the data from the current side, but otherwise, stream back to the, the infrastructure side so that we can have the so-called end-to-end tracing. Uh, end-to-end tracing today also works in, in, in for, in, to connect to the open census with Dapper, but only for sort of the cloud project, I mean the project that we own for debugging purpose, not for custom project because of privacy. Thank you, Wenbi.